Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you're all having a great conference so far. I'm excited to talk to you about rockets, rigs and renewables. Imagine an area so fertile that it is the breadbasket of an entire region. Wetlands as far as the eye can see, water buffalo, birds galore, and a thriving community, in some cases living on floating land, floating islands. Devastatingly, for political reasons, this area is drained of all its water. The wetlands turn to an arid landscape. Hydropower resources are lost. The food supply is devastated and access to clean water is no more. A half a million strong community quickly dwindles to less than 20,000 people. The reasons I'm aware of this is back in 2010 and 2011, I spent two years in Iraq following the second Gulf War. I was leading a team of consultants who are responsible for documenting, assessing and monitoring the, the environmental and social impacts following the war within and surrounding the local oil fields. Our job was to document the conditions prior to the major oil and gas companies moving back into the region. We lived on the US Army base in Basra and every day we'd head out into the oil fields. This would require nine armored land cruisers and 18 armored, armed personal security guards. It was no longer an active war zone, but it was certainly a unsafe place to be. Every morning we'd have a security briefing. We'd be alerted to um, potential threats, um, recent um, impacts, and also the, the impacts associated with rocket and mortar attacks from the night previous on the base. These were common occurrences and they were extremely stressful times. First, you'd hear the alarm. This would alert you to the pot potential for an incoming projectile. Then in each quadrant of the base, there'd be phalanx guns. These guns would be responsible for firing thousands of rounds into the sky to try and create a protective curtain around the base. Then would come the thud of the landing project projectile. At this point, we'd be lying face down on the ground, trying to save ourselves from shrapnel related injuries. A direct impact would have ruined our day, but there's nothing we could do about it. On one, one of these given security briefings, it was quite unusual as we are shown a video. The video being retrieved by the US Army the night previous. When a, when a rocket is launched, they had used sensors to detect the point of origin. They go out and explore this, the uh, launch point and potentially try and capture those responsible. This night they, record, they recovered a, a video. The, the attackers had, in the, in the process of rushing away, forgotten to take it, but they would use it to ensure payment to demonstrate they completed the mission. I was caught off guard by this video, as what it showed was two dads out on a wet and windy night. And the translation went something to effect, the effect of, man, this sucks. I wish I was at home tonight with my family. Whoosh, off goes the rocket. The guys pack up and walk away just like another day at the office. This was a game changing moment for me. Here we were sat on some, some of the largest oil and gas reserves in the world, generating billions of dollars of revenue, feeding our energy hungry society. Meanwhile, a local population was surviving on two to four hours of power a day. Infrastructure being devastated after years of conflict and um, unemployment rates were high. What sticks with me is that these two individuals appeared to be genuine family people. They didn't seem to take any pride or joy in releasing the rocket that night. This seemed to be an economic versus an ideological decision. And if it could happen to them, why couldn't it happen to you or I? Context matters in this story. When you consider if these two individuals had abundance and prosperity, would they have fired that rocket that night? In that moment, I realized they wouldn't. Throughout my time in Iraq, I continued to ask myself questions. The Gulf Wars were largely fought over energy. Energy is the lifeblood of everything, whether it be our caveman ancestors using fire or our modern day society using fossil fuels. Energy is the lifeblood of everything and our lifestyles as we know it would not be possible without it, which makes our energy transition 
massively important. The electrification of everything and doing so in a cleaner, more sustainable and more profitable way is extremely important. What I often hear from businesses is that the energy transition is too complex. We don't have the technologies or the capital to, to achieve our objectives. Where do I start? What's possible? What I never hear from the same businesses is that, that, that they, want, they don't want access to more affordable, more resilient, more secure energy. This energy nirvana is actually possible today. So why are we not seeing more action? Today, we're largely reliant on centralized infrastructure or centralized structures in general, whether it be government structures, business structures, our digital ecosystems, and particularly our energy, uh, energy um, infrastructure. And while centralized systems are more simple and easy to design and manage, they're also more rigid and vulnerable. They have single, single points of failure throughout. Today, we are building our businesses and communities of now and the future on an infrastructure that has been built over the hundred, last hundred years, whether that's gas pipelines or, or energy transmission lines. And what we're all realizing is that these are all extremely vulnerable whether from geopolitical risks, physical attacks like we're seeing in Ukraine today, cybersecurity concerns, severe weather events, wildfires, uh, a tree falling on a single transmission line, or even that suicidal squirrel that crawls into the local substation. Any of these can knock out the power for hours, weeks, or even months. In the US, where I'm based today, the cost of power outages to businesses alone is $1.5 billion per year straight off the bottom line. Here in Germany, manufacturing output is expected to drop 2.5% this year, 5% next year. This is largely as a result of escalating costs of energy and concerns over security. This isn't just impacting small and medium businesses. This is all businesses of all shapes and sizes. BASF recently came out and said they're now looking at where they can offshore their manufacturing to, to ensure more affordable and secure power. This will lead to the shuttering of operations and furloughs, which have major economic ripples throughout the whole country. And our knee-jerk reaction to these escalating costs and security concerns is to suddenly turn to coal-fired power plants, to try and accelerate the commissioning of LNG terminals, to deploy more utility-scale solar and wind farms. But what we are not considering is that all of these assets rely on, on a reliant, and affordable grid um, infrastructure. This grid infrastructure is becoming aging and more expensive to maintain, and it is certainly vulnerable. Today, we are reliant on this centralized and monopolized ecosystem. We are passive consumers of energy. We don't know where it comes from, even when we get it, and we have no control over how much it costs or how clean it is. We need to transition to a more distributed, decarbonized, and digitized future. There is no silver bullet to the energy transition, but on-site energy is going to play a major and critical role. On-site energy is where we generate and store energy at the location it is needed. These systems can operate independently or they can operate as part of an integrated distribution system. Leading businesses around the world today are deploying on-site energy solutions. These consist of solar, wind, gas, diesel, um, fuel cells, and even in the future, we'll see SMRs being deployed as on-site energy solutions, supported by battery storage of all shapes and sizes, including electric vehicles, and being manipulated by extremely powerful digital, digital control systems. And through advancements in simple to use apps and blockchain technologies, we'll see business leaders being able to control their own destiny. They'll be able to de determine whether they'll self-consume energy, buy it, sell it, trade it, these applications will allow us to crowdsource and crowdfinance solutions, monetize the assets, and ultimately being able to transact down to kilowatt levels. This decentralized, digitized, and decarbonized future will be more flexible, more secure, more resilient, and it will provide us with more control. So what is stopping us today as businesses around the world from deploying these systems? Business leaders are actually stumbling around in the dark they have an objective and they have a pain point, but they don't know who to turn to, what's possible or where to begin. Meanwhile, the supply side of the market 
is actively trying to sell their widgets and services. They are trying to force their solutions onto customers. We are not selling value to them. Today, there is a significant information asymmetry between those that want to buy these solutions and those that want to sell into them. We need to invest as an industry in more enabling technologies to enable business leaders to access the data, the intelligence, the information they need to understand where they can make the highest return on investment decisions. We also need to remove the regulatory roadblocks that prevent more on-site energy systems from being deployed. We need to challenge the monopolistic commercial models of the centralized grid, and we need to simplify and accelerate the process of deploying these systems. Today, up to 70% of project costs associated with on-site systems are in the form of sales and development costs before we even start to build the assets. This is not sustainable. Returning to Iraq, back in the 1980s, Iraq was actually um, one of the most advanced economies in the Arab world. Most of us don't know this. It had an extremely strong industrial um, industry. It, the, uh, its infrastructure and transport sectors were extremely strong. They had great medical, and medical care and a strong education system. This led to there being a really, really affluent middle class. This was all underpinned by having access to secure and reliable power. From the 90s onwards, extremist leadership, conflicts, and the devastation of this infrastructure led to energy being less reliable, less secure, industry shut down or left. This led to a lack of jobs. As we talked about at the start, the agricultural breadbasket was destroyed by draining the wetlands. And this all led to extremely high levels of unemployment, which leads to more rockets being launched. In Europe, we are potentially facing a devastating winter ahead. With these escalating energy costs and concerns about reliability, The Economist recently predicted up to 100,000 people could lose their lives as a result of power outages or not being able to afford to heat our homes. This is not acceptable. How many of you would sit here today and compare Europe to that of Iraq? It feels uncomfortable, doesn't it? but there's actually more similarities than we care to admit. I don't want any of you to have to experience the same situations I felt in Iraq, but I do want you to think about the impacts that we can all have on the industry. We should all be thinking about how we create a more sustainable, profitable, equitable, and thriving energy future for all. We don't want our breadbasket to be turned into a hostile desert scape. For me, The time in Iraq motivated me to go on this journey and it has led to the formation of Vector. And I'd want to, want to challenge each of you to think personally about how you are going to challenge the status quo and how you are going to create this thriving energy future for all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really interesting presentation with some very uh, sobering, uh, thought-provoking um, messages that, that, that you give. Um, What, what is it, I, I, I don't know what you, what you think your opinion is, but what is it that's going to take certain parts of the industry to wake up and think actually, you know, days have to change and they have to change quicker. We have to have, you know, the sort of energy, your, your own sort of sustainable supplies yeah. that you're talking about. What, what, what is it going to be? I think what's really exciting actually is that all the ingredients exist. The capabilities are there, the technology is there, the commercial structures are there. But it, it really is just empowering businesses to understand that there are other alternatives and that they can access these solutions and it doesn't have to be as complex as they realize. And really, I think that's what's exciting is within this room, we've got everything it takes. How do we bring it together and how do we deploy these solutions as a collaborative community versus all trying to steal our own little piece of the puzzle? We, we talk a lot about 2013 where, where we want to be particularly now standing in Europe in, in 2030. Um, I'm not going to go as far as 2030. I'm just going to ask you, because it, it's not that long. I'm going to ask you a couple of years down the line, so yep. two years down the line. Um, what would you like to be standing here talking about? What would you like to be on the agenda? What progress would you like to have seen? I'd love to see every major business in the world considering their on-site energy options. You know, on-site energy isn't for everyone, but there are solutions that can match many of the desired objectives, whether it's emission reduction, cost reduction, resilience. And I think 
the opportunity is how do you configure the solution to match that specific objective. And I think uh, we'll have succeeded if more businesses have considered it, deployed these solutions, create a more flexible, resilient um, ecosystem that we can then use to build off uh, in, the, in the years to come. Not right for everyone, but everyone needs to think about it. Exactly. All right, Gareth, thank you very much for joining us. Awesome, thank, thank you. you.